Ah, all right. I decided to um, do a video on hidden prophecy. Now there is lots of prophecy in the Bible. It's actually called a prophetic book. Um, many of the prophecies are incredibly detailed and uh, precise to exact days, and they're called and they're plain to read. And you can study them. But then there are some that are symbolic, or I like to call them hidden prophecies. So, what hidden prophecies? Now, I, I did um, I did one on the cross just recently, uh, just before. So the cross is, represents uh, there where Jesus died on the cross, and his blood covered the symbol of the cross, which was not what the Jews used. It was uh, the Romans' invention of called the crucifixion. Um, and they invented it, and they fulfilled prof prophecy. <laughs> they didn't even know they were doing it. So it represents the Garden of Eden here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or uh, the law. Law. In other words, um, what is right and wrong, and it's about man striving to be like God, because Adam actually reached for the fruit himself. He grasped to be like God. So Satan said, if you eat this fruit, you'll be like God. And so this is uh, represents man striving to be like God, to reach for it, to be like God, and uh, uh, attaining attaining that. Um, so that was man's efforts, basically. So if you want to thinking of it, it is efforts. Effort. And uh, works uh, is another one the Bible uses a lot. Works. Man's works. Uh, and that's the law, the rules, the law, trying to be good by your own behavior. You're trying to be good enough to please God, your own works. And you never can do that. So Jesus dies on the cross for our works and the effort. He does it all. He dies on the cross so we don't have to work. Well, uh, he, we just rest in his work, what he's accomplished. So therefore, no man can boast. We're all saved by grace. Grace is a gift from God. He has done it for us. It's not of works, at least any man should boast. So the cross there. So in the Bible, the cross is actually the ultimate pinnacle of salvation for mankind. Uh, we are uh, buried with Christ when we're baptized, into his death, and when we come out of the water, we're into the new life or the spiritual life which is what he's purchased as a new creation for us so the cross so the cross is actually hidden in the bible in quite a lot of a lot of places um as in the knowledge of good and evil there the cross was represented there um also when moses was uh they were slaves uh, um they were slaves in egypt um for 400 years um, on the day they were rescued and God brought them out and delivered them from their captivity, which is like captivity to sin, you could think, they had to live it, be, go in their house and eat a um, lamb without spot or blemish and eat it that night and cover the doorposts of their house using a hyssop, it's a tree called a hyssop branch, and they would have to cover the doorposts and the lintel with blood from the lamb and that night the destroying angel came across Egypt and when it saw it came across the houses which had the blood on the lintel and the doorposts it passed by and didn't kill the firstborn but when it got to the Egyptian homes and to the Pharaoh's home it killed the firstborn now Pharaoh uh, they believed Pharaoh was a god and that his son was a god. And so basically that was one of the judgments against Israel, as uh, Egypt, that you are not a god and neither is your son. Actually, all the ten plagues are all directed at the gods of Israel. They believed in the Ra god, the sun god, and so God darkened the sun. Uh, they believed in the river. Nile was a god, and so he turned it to blood. And so you realize he's judging the gods of his, uh, Egypt. Uh, before he lets his people go. So this is really important. Now what's important about this is the the, Jew, uh, the Jewish people living in their homes were protected by the blood. Now where is this blood applied? It was applied to the doorpost and the lintel. Now the lintel uh, 
is literally translated cross piece. There it is. The cross piece, the blood applied to the cross piece is what saved them from the destroying angel. So there we have uh, the cross being prophetically portrayed before Jesus died on the cross, thousands of years before, uh, with the nation of Israel. Now, what God showed through the nation of Israel and the, uh, the things they went through was all about what Jesus was going to do with, uh, in the world. So we see one prophecy about his salvation. Before they were freed, this is what saved them, the blood. Now, um, later on, Moses, so they got out of Egypt and they crossed through the part of the waters and they got out. And then uh, Moses is showed to build this tabernacle. Um, where the people could sacrifice animals and be forgiven of sins and things like that. And the priests were uh, doing their rituals to cleanse uh, the people. So we have some furniture here. Um, the altar, burnt, brazen altar where they'd burn their animal sacrifices. Uh, the priests would wash in the um, bronze, made of mirrors, bronze, labor. And... Uh, only the priests were allowed to go into this area, which was uh, is uh, the holy place, and then the Holy of Holies, which had the Ark of the Covenant, like in um, Raiders, Lost, uh, Raiders of Lost Ark. So, if we look at them, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The doorways are the way, the truth, and the life. So, he is saying, you cannot get to the Holy of Holies or Shekinah glory or God's presence unless you go through him. There's no way into the presence of God unless you go through him. The way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what Jesus said. So he was saying, he was trying to show the Jews that he is the doorways. He is the way, way there. So what has this got to do with the cross? Well, the, cro uh, the furniture, Moses was told, thousands, remember thousands of years before Jesus came and died on the cross, to um, put the furniture in this, laid out exactly like this, according to what he was shown. And if you draw a line through the furniture, it is a, it has been placed in a cross pattern. So they've laid out the furniture in the shape of a cross. Coincidences? I don't think so. So, um, sacrifice and washing, eating the bread, having the uh, light. Jesus is the light of the world, and he is the ark. Okay, so all of the furniture represents Jesus, and he is the way, the truth, and the life. This was all prophetically put in place ages before Jesus came by Moses and the children of Israel did this for over 1500 years before Jesus was born. Um, now, there's some really interesting cool stuff like this uh, lampstand or the golden lampstand. Um, it actually is uh, made up of uh, like a cantilever. Right? Um, it has uh, these little things with the oils on, and it's got these knobs and stuff. These knobs, and and the oils put in the dishes, and it's lit, and uh, it's all really fancy. But anyway, the area just happened to be, now this is kind of cool, happens to be 66 knobs and buttons. And it is the lampstand. Now in Psalms, the psalmist, the prophet David, Right, your word, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Now whether David knew it or not, he was prophesying about the word of God and the written scriptures. There just happens to be, what, 66 books in the Bible. Now how did, how did they get that back in Moses' day? How did they know who was going to write the last book of the Bible? All right, interesting. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. It's one of my favorite favorite verses. It was that my first verse I ever memorized. 
So we have the cross and we have the word of God, the lampstand, and the scriptures themselves and the books even represented in this furniture. It is an incredible um, study in every single part. Even the bronze laver was made out of the mirrors um, of the people, the woman. Uh, bronze mirrors, they used to look, uh, they didn't have obviously mirrors like us, so they had uh, these mirrors made out of bronze and they were all um, made, uh, made into this washing bowl. So in the verses in the New Testament, you read about the washing of the word and you look into it and so this is what's referring to. We're looking into the word of God, which is a mirror to, to our souls. So there's lots and lots of teaching and amazing revelation just in this part here. But you can see it is prophetic about the cross. No mistakes or coincidences. Then over here we have, uh, oh yeah, so that's some of the prophecies and they're pretty cool. I'll just flip over. Okay, so um, what about Jesus? Uh, some other prophecies. Some of my favorite prophecies are really easy and some of them are really well hidden. Well, Jesus is, uh, he comes to get baptized by John the Baptist and who's baptizing people in the Jordan River. And um, so here's the Jordan River there. Um, there's the Jordan River. And Jesus is here, and he's being baptized. And while he's being baptized, it says the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, comes comes down and descends upon him and abides on him, doesn't leave, in the form of a dove. Now, why, oh why, did the Holy Spirit take the form of a dove and then uh, come down and anoint Jesus? All right, interesting. Well, it just so happens that Back in before the world was destroyed by the global flood in Noah's day, that Noah was told to build this big massive giant ark, one of the biggest, one of the biggest boats ever built, and the whole world flooded, and the whole basically the water, the flood water it says in the scriptures killed everything, killed everything that had breath um, on the earth. So unless you were in the ark, you weren't saved. The only way of salvation, the only method of salvation was to be in the ark. Okay? So, only way of salvation um, was in the ark. Now, when the, um, they're in the ark and they're saved, now, to when the flood, Noah wanted to know when the flood waters had actually held far down, had they gone and were they receding and could they, uh, when were they going to get out of the ark? And so it'd been flooding, raining for 40 days, but flooding for about 150 days. And then they were in it for a lot longer than that as well. So they're in the ark. He sends out uh, uh, one of the birds he sends out, which came back with an olive branch, uh, olive. Um, in its mouth was a dove. Ooh, a dove. How coincidental. And it had the olive branch. Now, when we come back to Jesus' game, he's in the river, he's in the water, and the same thing happened here. The heavens uh, have opened its rain for 140, uh, for 40 days. But then when, it, when the, uh, it says the waters are receding or going down, in other words, the waters of death are starting to go down, what was killing everyone was going down and reversing. The dove with the olive branch comes back to the ark. Comes to the ark. So here we have Jesus. He's in this river. And this river flows all the way to the Dead Sea. So we have a river that flows to death. And he's Jesus is in this Jordan River. And the dove is coming and abiding on him. And anointing him. Now... If you understand what anointing was, it was when they anointed priests, they'd pour oil over them, and kings, they'd put oil over them. So here we have an anointing, or by the dove, and where does the anointing oil come from? It comes from the olive tree. So we have the dove with the olive branch coming to the only place of salvation in the earth, and Jesus being the Messiah, 
in the river that flows to death, he is being anointed for, by a dove, by the Holy Spirit. So he is the saviour of the world, is basically the prophecy here. And anyone in J Jerusalem who saw that would actually understand that. Now, back in the Old Testament in Joshua's day, when they're entering the promised land, the same sort of thing was happening again. And again, it's another really clear prophecy about Jesus. So they're just about to enter from the wilderness. And there's this river blocking them. And it's it, it's at flood time. And it's in flood season, so it's really deep. And it's overflowing its banks, it says. And there's the promised land, the land of Israel for the people, the promised land. So they're in the wilderness and they've been wandering around for 40 years and, the, and all the generation that came out of Egypt have died off and it's just new kids with them. And they come up to this river and um, um, Joshua was told, get the priests to hold the Ark of the Covenant and walk into the water. And when their feet touch the water, the river's going to stop, stop. Like it's going to uh, allow you to walk walk through. So the, the priests there holding the ark. I don't know if there were two priests holding it or four. I don't know. But anyway, the priests walk in and their feet touch the water. And it says the waters of the River Jordan uh, stop and pile up in a big pile. And then it starts to back up the river. The waters start to back up and go up the river in reverse. And they go up to, back up, to a city called Adam. Now, how coincidental is this? The waters that flow to death, the Dead Sea, or death, are stopped and back all the way up, back to Adam. See, this is Adam representing Adam's sin, or Adam's transgression. So, who's the ark there? There's an ark there. We already know that Noah's ark represents Jesus. And this ark, where the blood is applied on top, covers sin. So the ark represents, in both situations, Jesus again. So Jesus, in this case, the ark touches the water and backs sin, or the rivers of death, all the way back to Adam. And that's exactly what he's doing in the Jordan River when he's baptized. He goes into the water and he's showing, I am the saviour of the world, I am the ark, I am stopping the flow of death back to Adam, and allowing people to come into the promised land, the kingdom of God through me, through my works. And that is uh, some hidden prophecies about the work and uh, of Jesus and the Bible through the